Hello, this is Michael Clemens with Xtel in Japan.、Uh, we're here today on our new Xtel podcast with our guest, Stefan Reinwald, who joins us from London. He's the head of equity research at Waverington Investment Management, has over 30 years of professional experience in Japanese and Pan Asia equities.、Uh, I've probably known you for most of those 30 years. But、uh, would you like to give us a little bit more color on what Waverton is doing and, and how you're feeling about Japan these days? Okay, thank you, Michael.、Um, Waverton、uh, is a London based company.、Um, we changed the name to Waverton from Cheo Hamber Investment Management in 2013 after a management buyout.、Uh, we now just completed a corporate action and we have now almost 20 billion pounds under management. So that's give or take $26 billion. Uh, a good portion is invested in Japan as we are overweight Japan and positive on Japan. So we have around 1.5 billion in Japan、uh, of our equity portion, representing between 10 and 15 percent, depending on the risk profile of the mandates and portfolios we hold these equities. And、um, as to our view on Japan, we are positive.、Um, actually, we are quite positive for the very simple reason. Um, during the Koizumi times,、um, we had the first green shoots of corporate governance, the hope that Japan is changing, the arrival of shareholder activism. And,、uh, you know, we saw share buybacks being implemented, we saw dividend growth. And then, the, unfortunately, the financial crisis came, followed by the Tohoku earthquake, and Japan really went into hibernation. And when Abe took office, you know, he had the three arrows,、uh, what he wants to achieve. And what is interesting during Koizumi, it was hope for change, it was hope for reform. And with the corporate governance changes implemented under the Abe administration, we actually had factual change. We had the introduction of the corporate governance code, we had the introduction of the stewardship code, we had iterations of them、uh, over, the, over time. And we have now quite a robust corporate governance framework. It might be noteworthy to say that the stewardship code was modeled after the UK stewardship code. So it was not a, spe- a special Japanese version rather than an internationally accepted、uh, version. And that has been implemented. And corporate Japan has been responding accordingly. We had record high dividends, we have record high share buybacks, shareholder return is, is strong in most instances. And additionally,、um, we have.、Uh, The TSE joining the party. So we now have all interests aligned. We have the politicians, we have the Ministry of Finance, we have the regulator, the FCA, and now we also have the stock exchange promoting corporate governance, focus on returns, focusing on cost of capital, and focusing on economic and market value creation. So I think all stars are aligned. Corporate Japan is responding. It's factual rather than hope, what we've seen at the beginning of, of this decade, of this century. So, Japan's finally get on board with what the rest of the globe pretty much has been、um, performing at.、Uh, how, how do you feel、uh, the global economic conditions are impacting the Japanese stock market at the moment?、Uh, Japan, s、uh, no, throughout globalization, has become more and more sensitive to global economics. So, they will be impacted depending on the economic activity around the world and especially in, in the US.、Uh, but、um, As I just described, there's a lot of self help, there's a lot of、uh, improvement going on that's very, very company specific.、Uh, and that should help to limit to an extent the exposure to global cyclicality, which undoubtedly is still there.、Uh, but if we do get a soft landing, I think that would be、uh, very easy for corporate Japan, international corporate Japan, to absorb. And I, I always love catching up with you because、uh, you, you always come and meet so many different companies and, and have so many different stories. It's always proof that the stock market's more interesting than the fixed income market.、Um, what, what sectors do you think are most interesting at the moment and performing well in Japan? Which do you think are struggling?、Um, it's difficult to say because, again, that's sort of a top down. A few, and we are very much bottom up. So we can find interesting opportunities in many sectors.、Mm. Um, so, but it's undoubtedly, I think, companies that benefit from long term structural trend,、uh, trends,、uh, energy transition, for example, you know, the demand for electricity,、uh, not just from the energy transition, but also from data centers, energy management. So I think that's a very interesting. 
uh, area to look at uh, over the long run. I think the runway is multi, multi years uh, going into the 30th. Uh, so that's an interesting one. Uh, but there are also other global trends. Um, I think there is the continued uh, miniaturization of semiconductor uh, production on the geometry, which basically means you need um, uh, better machines. Uh, you need uh, materials. Uh, Japan is leading in electronic materials. So again, there is a cyclical element to it as to the semiconductor cycle, but structurally, I think that's also a growth area. And then probably the most controversial view uh, would be uh, company specific. Um, I think a lot of people thought that Toyota is a laggard, is going to lose out on electrification. And uh, as time went by, uh, I think the proof came out that uh, there was no first mover advantage. I think Toyota with its multi-path strategy is offering vehicles globally to everybody in everybody's, in everybody's jurisdiction. So it takes into account the regulatory environment, the charging infrastructure, uh, the political will as to subsidies, and most importantly also the affordability. And um, Toyota is offering a product lineup that caters for global penetration, whereas others simply started to focus on EV only, and that was then limiting to Europe and, and to China. China turned into a Red Sea, and Europe, with, with subsidies coming down, see demand for EVs going down because of affordability. And uh, Toyota is probably the only company that is able to weather this in a very, very cash flow generating way. Okay, interesting. I mean, we're we're in the middle of our Japan survey at the moment, um, and and I think for the last year, if not more, all eyes have been on Japan, and and this coupled with the weak yen has made it really attractive for a lot of investors. But what do you think with regards to uh, the Bank of Japan's monetary policy at the moment? Do you think it's influencing the stock market, or do they care? Because uh, I think you know some people would argue they're not going to really do much about the yen. Um, because they're waiting to see what the salary increases are going to do to earnings, et cetera. But then at the end of the day, I think they're concerned about what are the cost of goods for, for Japanese companies. So what, what do you have any views or th that you can express on the Bank of Japan's monetary policy? Uh, I mean, as you could see from the 5th of August, over the short term and, and hot and speculative money is moving uh, in line with what is coming out from the Bank of Japan and, and, and from politicians. So yes, there's undoubtedly an impact, both on the stock market as, as well as on the currency, which at the peak was at 165 to the dollar and then strengthened to just below 140. Um, right. Interestingly, that's just reversing the losses it had since the beginning of the year. So for 2024, the currency is actually largely unchanged. Um, mm. So if you take a bit of a longer term perspective, uh, there was volatility, uh, it affected the market negatively as it did affect the market positively when it weakened to 165. Uh, but if you look at the Bank of Japan policy, I think you need to see this in the Japanese context. You know, the Japanese very, very rarely shoot from the hip. And I think that, that, that it's very easily to map out what's going to happen going forward. They abolished the negative interest rate policy, moved from SERP, zero interest rate policy, to marginally positive, and then at the 25 basis points increase. So now it's 25 basis points, which is still very, very low. And as you said, I think they're now looking what are the wage growth figures doing? How will that translate into real wage growth? And what will be the impact of, on the economy? And then they have a clearer picture of that, which I think will be positive, as wage growth just has been implemented. July, August, September. So I think we need to see. We will see in the in the fourth quarter of twenty four, and then moving into twenty five. And when they have a clearer picture, if the, the deflationary psychology has been broken, if wage growth is coming through, if people are a bit more relaxed on spending, I think we're going to get another twenty five basis points probably in February, and maybe another twenty five during the end of uh, twenty twenty five. And uh, I think everybody can live with 75 basis points. Listed corporate Japan is um, is cash rich, so they should benefit from that. But also, I think 75 basis points on the short end should also not derail uh, small, medium-sized businesses um, as these are still record low interest rate levels. So I think it will be a positive. 
I think the yen will probably remain a bit volatile short term, but at the end should probably settle somewhere between 135 to 150. And if you speak to companies, they are telling you that we want a stable yen, we don't want a volatile currency. And if it's 150 or 140, uh, we don't really care as long as we have predictability. Now, on, on previous episodes, we've talked about M&A and we've talked about how uh, companies are purchasing smaller companies to combine them simply because the demand is there, but the population simply isn't there in the workforce. And and so we, as we see the aging of the Japanese population and the fact that there's, uh, I, I say this over and over, more people over 65 per capita in the world and less under 15 years old per capita in the world, wouldn't would you agree that the population is one of the largest um, challenges going forward? Uh, absolutely. I I ask this question every company that I'm seeing. I'm seeing about 170. I have 170 company meetings a year, and I ask in every meeting, "What's your biggest headache?" And 95 percent of the corporates respond, "Human resources." So mm. uh, you know the labor force, uh, the aging population. Uh, less labor market participation, I think, is a big challenge for, for corporate Japan. Uh, and uh, I think the solution to this is addressing the labor market challenges, i.e. increasing the workforce participation, uh, be it from making part-timers, full-timers, be it more female participation, uh, creating more flexible working models. Um, you know, there are interesting startups that are very actively engaged in this, matching labor where it is needed and where it is offered um, and, um, and, and and simply making sure that um, uh, we have proper labor market reform from that perspective. Uh, but also you have um, the opportunity of automation and the opportunity of digitalization. So I think there are three three areas where we can address uh, the labor market challenge, which is probably on balance the biggest challenge for Japan. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've heard that, that they really knew about this in the early 70s, but never really took it into account seriously. And and even now, you know, talking to people like yourself, uh, I think if they don't get it right now, then there's going to be a big effect, you know, 20, 20 25 years from now, more, more so than anything. And... Um, uh, so, so it's interesting going forward. And, and there, of course, is, is is potential immigration. Although I think that will be a slow burner. But we have seen the first steps that uh, you know you get preferred working visas uh, for foreigners that work at Japanese companies overseas. So people working in a Toyota factory or a supplier in Vietnam, uh, they can easily get a working visa for. Uh, a job in, in, in Japan for a Toyota supplier or Toyota itself. Uh, so that has been more relaxed, in, but these are baby steps. I think this is a, a slow long-term burner, but it's also an opportunity for Japan to address this over the long run. What about corporate tax when you compare it to Japan, for example, to Singapore or even Hong Kong? Um, I mean, does anyone really pay the tax level that, that corporate tax allegedly is in Japan? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think listed Japan, uh, in large cap listed Japan, probably yes. Okay. Uh, but small, medium sized enterprises, I think there are many, many loopholes, and uh, the headline rate is 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 much higher than what actually the real tax receipts for the government uh, mm. are. So, yeah. on 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 aggregate for Japan as an economy, uh, it's definitely not the headline rate. But for listed Japan, it largely is. Uh, however, you have to take into account that global companies pay a lot of taxes in their relevant jurisdictions, right. and most of them are lower. So if you have a bigger U.S. business, your aggregate consolidated tax rate will be lower than the Japanese headline rate by definition. Uh, but domestic companies listed probably pay the, pretty much the, the, the headline rate, whereas small, medium-sized enterprises, which is the vast majority, unlisted small mom and pops, they probably pay very little tax. And, and are those big firms also carrying losses forward, even from the bubble era? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, no, no. That, that that's going very quickly. I think there are a few losses carry forward, uh, but they also have worked out that they are related to COVID, mm -hmm. uh, where companies fell into a deficit. I'm thinking of you know domestic transportation companies like the railways, like the airlines, 
Um, but um, that is that's largely washed out already, or is washing out and coming to an end. So, but nothing from the bubble area. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I first came in '89 to Japan, and the market was at thirty-five thousand. Uh, I think you and I were together when the market was at seven thousand, and now it's back up. You know, to to kind of into the bubble era uh, levels. What's going to take us further? I mean, what's going to unlock the growth that that everybody's looking for versus value in Japan? Um, it's interesting because since the peak of the bubble in '89. Um, well, let me start this way. I think Japan is a very, very good case for being an active manager. Mm. Uh, yes, the index is basically just above the peak levels at 89, which is now 35 years ago. So a lot of cynic, cynical people say we had to wait for 35 years to get our money back. Um, mm. And that headline buys on an index is true. Topics, take it Nikkei, whatever you want to take. Uh, however, uh, the reason for that was that uh, financials, real estate, asset plays, utilities, you name it, have been such a big portion of the market in 89. And these areas were structurally challenged. Mm. And they were a drag on index performance. Since 89, you had companies that are now blue chip companies, leading companies in Japan. I'm thinking of Toyota, number one. I'm thinking of Sony, number two. I'm thinking of um, Heans, number three, Hitachi. Uh, mm. A lot of them are actually much, much higher. A Hoya, a Shimano, what's now regarded as, as international, international gold standard are now the leaders in Japan. And they have brought back Japan where it is now. If you look at the other side, you know, it's a bit difficult to judge by banks because they have been consolidating. But relative to 89, they're still way below where they've been. Some of them as low as it's still down 80, 70 percent. Mm. Uh, real estate, utilities, the same picture. So what was weighed quite highly in 89, largely sailing to the sunset of irrelevance. Um, and is still very, very low. Uh, whereas the slack has been picked up by companies like a Keyens that is up 5,000 or 6,000 percent since. So it is very diverse. And if you've been index tracker in 89, you suffered and you had to wait so long for, to get your money back. If you would have been an active fund manager and would have avoided the problematic areas, uh, you would have made an awful lot of money. So true. There's that's several my, thousand. That's my take. Yeah. A lot of those companies had several thousand percent returns, for example, yes, uh, during correct. that time period. When we look at Japan as a snapshot, uh, I think the other reality is if you go back 20 years, there was probably 100 people trading Japanese equities, whether they're still trading or whether you know they retired or not. I don't think anybody has ever left the instruction to reallocate more to Japan. Um, do, do you feel that this is the time that portfolio managers should be allocating more to Japan? Uh, we, absolutely, oh, we, did, we did. We did. We did it. Uh, although it's not, it's less an allocation to Japan per se. It's mm. more an allocation that Japan is such an interesting market and attractive market to find ideas, to find bottom-up stocks and companies. Uh, and if you put it into global context, that's how we derived our almost three times overweight position in Japan. So it is driven by what we can find and what looks attractive for an investment purpose rather than making a wholesale top-down macro allocation to Japan. But yes, I think uh, people should take note uh, of what corporate Japan has to offer, uh, should take note the valuation levels of these companies uh, and uh, the improvements and changes they are going through. So corporate governance will be here to stay. Improvements will play out. Um, over time, and uh, yes, uh, people should take note of um, of investing in Japanese companies. So, so coming from the UK and also Europe, um, when it comes to ESG, um, there's lots of arguments that you know Japanese are pivoting away from ESG, or ESG is not important. Or you go into an IR meeting and they said no investor ever asks us about ESG. Do you feel ESG is still something? that's uh, relevant in conversations as, as an investor? Um, I think you've got to differentiate. I think every single Japanese company presentation has an ESG sec section these days. Right. So I think that you need to dig a bit deeper if this is just you know ticking a box or if there is something material to it. 
And I think that very much reflects our approach to, to ESG overall. Uh, you know, we identify what factors are material to a company, to its outlook, uh, what provides an opportunity, what provides a challenge, and um, what will have an economic impact on a company. And I give you an example. If you take acai as a brewer, water usage and wastewater production is a, a big ESG factor for them. But at the same time, it's also a big economic factor for them because if they use less water, if they have to recycle less wastewater or dispose of water, uh, that's a positive economic impact for their business. So this is where sort of economics marry uh, ESG factors. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, a bank has a different uh, materiality matrix to ESG than a chemical company. Um, and the same with communication and maybe retailing. You know, you might have a more social element on retailing as to workers' health and safety as a supply chain management, uh, whereas chemical companies have a lot of greenhouse gas elements to it and have a lot of uh, energy elements to it. So I think it's really to focus on the, the relevant metrics and then dig deeper into the companies. Uh, do they comply? Do they acknowledge? And do they have processes in, play, in place to to deal with the challenges, but also to exploit the opportunities that these factors bring. And um, when you think about both Japanese corporate culture and also their boards and and the fact that the board really is the one that should probably be dictating governance, should be really kind of dictating the direction of the company, etc. What What is your view on, on Japanese boards these days in comparison to yesteryear? Um, it, it really, again, depends, you know, the, the, the top quality companies, they have a pretty robust, um, you know, policy in place as to board diversity, as to board independence, as to bringing in expertise from independent outside directors. Um, I can't give you a percentage of all listed companies, uh, but I'm sure that there are still many where this doesn't play an important role. But this is also why they're lacking in share price performance and also fundamental performance. So I think the pool is big enough to select the ones that have robust policies in place. Um, and um, there are in, an increasing number uh, that, that do offer that. So um, I'm pretty relaxed about this. But on aggregate, Japan could certainly do better on that, no doubt. Okay. Uh, last two questions. Uh, we have a new prime minister. Do you... <laughs> Do you feel that the political landscape in Japan affects the, the market in any way that anyone pays attention? It certainly affects hedge fund managers that second guess <laughs> what the new policy might be or might not be. Right. And I think the change in prime minister was a very good example. It was a real roller coaster ride. Everybody sure. was, was expecting a different candidate to win on a Friday. Yes. The market was up 5% in dollar terms. And then the outcome came out after the market. And the stock market was down 4% on Monday uh, mm. because a different candidate won. And everybody yeah. was second guessing about policies. And, and what everybody found out is that we're probably now having a Kishiba. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that uh, the new prime minister obviously had to adopt to a lot of um, party internal pressure and, yeah. and compromised on on almost all of it, uh, his, um, you know, his views. And uh, basically, <laughs> we're going to get continuity. We'll see what the elections are going to bring. And mm. we'll see how long that that sort of approach of compromising uh, will see him last. But um, it, it's definitely continuity rather than sort of radical uh, views that he went on record with uh, over the last few years. Yeah. It's definitely the roller coaster, I think, is the best way to describe it. And, and the fact that we we're looking at Koizumi's son possibly coming in to office when uh, you know, his, his father was was the one uh in office when the mark was at seven thousand. Um, just just one last, you know, any any closing comments you would have or recommendations you would have for people that are getting into the market for the first time or people, you know, looking at the Japanese market in general? Um, I, I would have a couple of them. I would say the first one would be go to Japan. Go right. to Japan as long as it's cheap. Um, it it is is a great country. Uh, it is not expensive as a lot of people think, uh, as it was in the past. Uh, and 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 familiarize yourself. 
and then dive deeper into corporate excellence of Japan. And you will find many ideas that will fit the criteria of an equity investment. Uh, and again, as we started up with, uh, it will be through all kinds of sectors. It can You can find very interesting retail concepts. Uh, you can find global leaders um, in, in the manufacturing industry, in automation, um, in the material space, um, where the Japanese dominate on functional materials, on electronic materials. So you can you can really dive deep and find a lot of very interesting opportunities. Uh, what you will have to do is you will have to spend uh, shoe leather costs. You know, you will have to spend time and money um, to, to do the research because, as you said before, Michael, uh, over the years, resources deployed to Japan on research, uh, on coverage, on the sales side, um, but also in general on, on Japanese specialists have been coming down dramatically. So uh, you really need to you know, do your own primary Right. Uh, using what's left, yeah. and um, and that is also then an, a significant source of alpha because it's not just hugging the consensus because consensus is is mainly meaningless. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you coming on the podcast today. I know you're very busy, and uh, we hope to see you very soon in Japan. Definitely. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, have a great day. Thank you.